on Prime Crime. One of the darkest days in our nation's history. On a personal level, you, as a dad, I kind of have this guilt, like, I should have known. Becomes a battle for the truth. You got parents laughing, going, ha, 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 watch this, and then going, <gasps> method acting, going, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> it just is the fakest thing since the $3 bill. I wasn't able to keep my six-year-old son safe. So you can imagine somebody going after my older son, and there's something that I can do about it. I am 100% gonna do that. This is a struggle session, are we in China? I've already apologized to the parents over because and over again. You know, I don't objection, apologize to you. Objection, don't apologize objection. to you. Hey there, everybody. I'm Jesse Weber, and welcome to Prime Crime. This is where we break down the most high-profile and memorable true crime cases. In 2012, one of the worst shootings in our nation's history was carried out. But now imagine a loud voice coming out and saying, it never happened. 911 State Police can help you. There's a shooting at Daniel Elementary School. Then you're talking that again. December 14th, 2012, Newtown, Connecticut. Reports of gunfire at an elementary school suddenly shatter the quiet and calm of this small town community. John 911, what's the location of your emergency? Sandy Hook Elementary School, 12 Dickinson Drive. Okay, I've got that. What's going on down there? This, I believe they're shooting at the front, at the front glass. Something's okay. going on. I'm All right, I want you to take cover. So I was at work in the hospital and I got a phone call and so I sent it to voicemail and then, um, but I had this weird feeling because um, it was from it was from the school district. It was just a really just curt kind of cold uh, message saying that all the schools in Newtown have been put on lockdown because of a reported shooting. State police emergency. Standing up school, I, I need assistance here immediately. Okay, ma'am. I'm in a classroom with kids. I honestly didn't think anything of it being at an elementary school. Alyssa, on the other hand, being a fabulous mother that she is, I mean, she called me right away and she was really really worried. She knew that Emily's classroom was one of the first classrooms as you enter into the school. State police emergency, are you calling in a shooting? Yes, Sandy Hook okay. School. Where are you right now, ma'am? I am in the library. So there's no children in the library with you? There are, but they are safe. Okay, make sure you lock the doors and all that, okay? We have somebody on the way. I remember parking my car as I was driving from work about a quarter of a mile away. I didn't realize the gravity of what had happened. I knew that there had been a shooting at the school. I was thinking a domestic violence uh, uh, event. Advisor, we're working on an active shooting in Utah right now. We're working on an active shooting at a school in Utah right now. SWAT teams in route. When I arrived, it was obviously so much more. I mean, there, there, the military was there, or people in, in military uniforms. Uh, almost every police and ambulance in the state had arrived. Do you have oh anybody God. with you right now? Do you have any children with you? I have no children. I have five adults, and one's been shot twice. One's been crazy. shot twice. Where are you? I'm in the first conference room. OK, are they, are they uh, breathing and talking to you? She's breathing, but she's barely. OK, do you know she's when right shoot or when? He's right outside the door. He shot 100 shots. We had heard that there were children that had been transported to the hospital, so I was trying to see if if Emily had maybe come to the hospital because we hadn't been able to locate her yet. That's kind of how the news broke to us and how we first started coming to terms in, in, with what was happening. Please hurry, please hurry, please hurry. They're on the way. Just try to stay calm. Please, Jesus. Just try to stay calm, okay? All right? Please, Jesus. Please, Jesus. I know you're, I know you're, you got to listen to me. Take a deep breath, okay? Think of your children, okay? Remember their faces. Try to stay calm. you got to stay strong for them, okay? Thank you, the police officer just came in. Is he, oh, is there a policeman there? Yes. Okay, okay, all right, you guys are okay, all right? Okay, good. People running everywhere, parents tearfully with their children in their arms. I ran and just tried to find somebody that looked official and asked them if they had seen Jesse Lewis. I had uh, 
a state trooper asked me for a picture of Jesse. And then he came back and he was being nonchalant, asking me for um, any identifying marks on Jesse's body. And I remember thinking, ah, oh, he has a mole on the top of his right foot. And this is not, it's not a good question to be asking with a positive outcome. It was just a slow dawning over the course of the next few hours without being told anything that Jesse wasn't coming back. The day would end in the deaths of 20 children, six adult staff members, the shooter's mother, and himself as well. Jesse was like a ball of fire. He, he had so much energy, bounced from couch to couch, he was very loud, he was very self-confident, but he was also my little cuddle bunny. And, and just really, just, just the sweetest, most incredible kid, almost always with a smile. The Sandy Hook Elementary School Massacre has been considered one of the worst mass shootings in American history. Emily was the epitome of what childhood happiness and joy is, is all about. Um, anybody that got an opportunity to meet or be around Emily, they always left with a fun memory. And when Emily was born, I was floored and totally shocked by how much I could immediately love somebody so intensely. And it was almost like scary. On a personal level, you, as a dad, I kind of have this guilt like I should have known. I didn't even know that I was, I was gonna have to start grieving. I was scared that my daughter might have gotten hurt or that she was just scared. While the nation reeled from the horror of that day, something unexpected happened. Uh, let's talk to uh, Kevin. Kevin, uh, go ahead, uh, you're on the air. Hi, I was uh, calling about Sandy Hook. Uh, basically my take on it is I live about 50 miles from Newtown and the whole thing is pretty much the next step in reality TV. You've got a bunch of people walking around a parking lot. It's pretty much what it comes down to. And none of the- No, no, I've had the t investigators on. I've had the state police have gone public, you name it. it. The whole thing is a giant hoax. This is Alex Jones. Would they stage this? I don't know. The penguins live in Antarctica? Jones is the founder and host of Infowars.com a live streaming conspiracy theorist website. Now you can watch The Alex Jones Show live as it happens at infowars.com slash show. You'll find links to all of our content there and a free 15-day trial for Prison Planet TV. If he sees something hit on his website, they'll try to emulate that. They want to repeat those spikes in traffic. And what we saw is that when he did his first really big story on Sandy Hook, his own sort of homegrown version of this lie, then it actually became the third most popular story on InfoWars ever. If you've got a school of 100 kids and then nobody can find them, and you've got parents laughing going, ha, 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 and then they walk over to the camera and go, ha, 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 and, and I mean, not just one, but a bunch of parents doing this, and then photos of kids that are still alive, they said died, I mean, they think we're so dumb that it's, it's, it's really hidden in plain view. Immediately after the Sandy Hook shooting, Jones began to promote the idea that this wasn't real. We're back, and I've been monitoring the news. It is a firestorm. They want total bans of all semi-autos, just as we knew they would do. You've heard me say, look for a big mass shooting at schools. You gotta go with your gut, man. My gut tells me I've never felt this freaked out. I told my wife that last night and this morning, and, uh, I really think they're going to try to come after the guns. It's going to start a civil war. They knew exactly how much this was resonating with their audience. I mean, they just had the, the sort of perfect storm of an issue they knew their audience cared about, which they tied to guns, and this sensational story wrapped around a, an, an event that a lot of people, particularly those with less firm grasp on reality, simply did not want to believe happened. And so it was, it was just fodder for him. He, he, again, he didn't believe any of it, but it was something that could make him money. I said, they are launching attacks. They're getting ready. I can see them warming up with Obama. They've got a bigger majority in the Congress now in the Senate. They are going to come after our guns, look for mass shootings. And then magically it happens. We had just been told that we lived in a world where somebody was capable of going into an elementary school and opening fire on six-year-old kids. 
So you, you just barely start to wrap your head around the fact that that's something that can happen and it happened to you. Emily died Friday morning, and so within 48 hours, I was already introduced to this new dimension of, of reality that we live in. I mean, folks, we've got video of Anderson Cooper with clear blue screen out there. He's not there in the town square. We've got people clearly coming up and, and, and laughing and then doing the fake crime. We've clearly got people where it's actors playing different parts of different people. When we come back, Alex Jones's words have dire results. Within 48 hours after Emily dying, um, to already start to get attacked by conspiracy theorists, spreading lies about me, saying things threatening my life, threatening uh, who I am, threat and questioning what happened. It's not our government, it's the globalist. And all I know is thousands of people have died in Mexico from Fast and Furious, many of them children. So don't ever think this couldn't be staged. After the 2012 Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting in Newtown, Connecticut, resulting in the deaths of 20 children and seven adults, conspiracy theorist Alex Jones immediately started casting doubt on the authenticity of the mass murder. The general public doesn't know the school was actually closed the year before. They don't know they've shielded it all, demolished the building. They don't know that uh, they had the kids going in circles in and out of the building as a photo op, blue screen, green screens. But it took me about a year with Sandy Hook to come to grips with the fact that the whole thing was fake. I mean, even I couldn't believe it. I knew they jumped on it, used the crisis, hyped it up, but then I did deep research and my gosh, it just pretty much didn't happen. And for Jones and Infowars, it was working. Alex Jones here to break down some exciting developments in the area of research concerning supplemental iodine. It's nothing less than phenomenal. On certain days when they would cover Sandy Hook, they would see almost a doubling of sales on those days, a doubling of traffic. They, they absolutely understood what this story was doing for them. From 2012 to 2022, the man has brought in $500 million in revenue selling these products, these supplements, these preparedness kits, the prepackaged food. We were able to see the profit margins that he had on that. The man has a thousand percent markup on these products and was just pocketing all of that money. What is my, what does the new magazine say? You can get it by subscribing. You can, uh, you can get 12 issues, great way to, this man wants your guns. There was public polling showing that nearly one in four Americans believed that Sandy Hook was either possibly or definitely staged. And if you think about that, that's 75 million Americans. And Mr. Jones was the only, and I mean this, the only commercially marketed media outlet that was pushing these lies. When I just saw the heavy, heavy, heavy scripting, that was what was so clear. And then the parents laughing, and then one second later doing the actor breathing to cry. I mean, it just, it's, it's just over the top. And we know they've staged other stuff before. He questioned my behavior when I gave a, a public statement uh, just to, in memory of Emily. I gave this kind of wry smile and did this like nervous laugh. Um, honestly, that's just a way that I, I try and calm myself down. So Alex Jones used those three seconds of me having a very human moment. And he said that this isn't behavior of somebody who just lost a child. So making a pretty extreme cl claim that would be a very thing vivid in your memory, holding his dead child. Now here is an account from the coroner that does not cooperate with that narrative. That was incredibly painful. I had held Jesse as well. Imagine cradling your, your dead son and then having somebody mock you in doing that. It's just unimaginable. Jones's followers, though, weren't just listening. They were getting angry and focusing their attention on the parents who lost children that day. These parents, when you start talking about something like death threats, right, that, that has become a matter of routine for many of them. And there have been a large handful of these folks who have done things like desecrate the memorials to their children, who have shown up at their homes. There have been a person who fired a firearm outside of Neil's house. Lenny Posner was being stalked by a woman in Central Florida 
when after he had moved from Newtown after too much harassment. It was InfoWars who revealed that he had moved to Boca Raton. You got parents laughing, going, ha, 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 watch this, and then going, oh, method acting, going, oh, 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 it's child laughing. I mean, it's just ridiculous. You got coroners that start laughing, and I don't mean uncomfortably, I mean like laughing with the state police when they're giving press conferences. I mean, it just is the fakest thing since the $3 bill. And you better get ready for more of it, folks. Initially, it was just stuff that was online comments online saying like, you know, you're going to burn in hell. But then when they start sending letters to your home, they know where you live and they start to say like, we're watching you. It stinks that I have. You got the, the actor father who, and then he walks out and, and, then he's, and then he's totally sad, crying, he was cracking jokes right before. That's an actor. That's an actor. The best example that I have, four years after the shooting, and I'm walking down the street and this guy just notices me. and. Um, so I stop and, and he asks me, didn't you have a child that died? And I said, yes. I was like, my oldest daughter, she was a victim at Sandy Hook Elementary School. And he, he just stared at me and he had the most hateful look in his face. And he just, how do you sleep at night, you son of a And he just started spouting all of these things that I had heard Alex Jones say on, on his broadcasts. So I turn around and I start walking in the other direction. And he follows me for blocks, swearing, swearing, swearing. I finally spoke up and defended myself and just defended who Emily was. Folks, they staged Aurora. They staged Sandy Hook. The evidence is just overwhelming. Somebody's got to tell you the truth. Somebody's got to stand against these people. At, at Jesse's wake, there were thousands of people. It was amazing how many people came, but also the different types of of individuals, uh, including a biker gang. And uh, I thought, well, the world is mourning. But then later found out that they were there, ironically, to keep the peace because a group had filed a petition or, or filed for a permit to protest the children's funerals. I guarantee you they're getting ready for false flags. They, all the signs are there, and they're going to blame it on us, and we've got to instantly come out and not take the guilt they put on us. Phone calls, emails, upsetting emails about your son and death threats. One in particular targeted my, my older son. I wasn't able to keep my six-year-old son safe, Jesse. So you can imagine somebody going after my older son and there's something that I can do about it. I am 100% gonna do that. Coming up, these parents take action. I will not perjure myself under the orders of a judge. This has never before been done in US history. It's a struggle session right out of communist China or South Africa. This is serious tyranny. State Police, 911, what's the location of your emergency? We're at Sandy Hook, um, Sandy Hook School in uh, Sandy Hook. Um, okay, what is... We, we hear shots. Barricade the door, barricade the door, if you could push desks in front of or something. Okay. The Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting resulted in the deaths of multiple children and adults and left families and a community in devastation. But that wasn't all. In the aftermath, InfoWars founder and host Alex Jones promulgated the theory that this shooting was staged. How do you deal with a total hoax? I mean, it just, how do you even convince the public something's a total hoax? But remember, this is the same White House that's been caught running the fake Bin Laden raid. People just instinctively know that there's a lot of fraud going on. In that first week, I already started to become fearful of uh, the attacks that people were saying to me. When I get an email from somebody a few days after Emily has died talking about how if they ever see me they want to bash my head in with a baseball bat, I have to take that very, very seriously. After Jones's comments started circulating, victims' family members became the subject of intense harassment and there were targets on their backs. And so much transpired when we talk about this conspiracy world within that first week, receiving these threats to where you're making plans with 
uh, how you're going to handle security at a funeral home in case anything happens. I mean, that's the most absurd thing that you can think about when all you want to do is just remember who your daughter is. And about 10 minutes before the funeral home was going to open the doors, I was trying to find Alyssa there and somebody said, you need to come here. And there was this coat closet and she's sitting down on the floor of the coat closet and she's wrapped up. She's just bawling and she says, like, I just don't know if I can do this. Now, as time went on and the years went by, Alex Jones would eventually attempt to backtrack and recant his statements. On Father's Day, I want to reach out to the parents of the slain children at the horrible tragedy in Newtown, Connecticut, and give you my sincere condolences. But it was too late. Beginning in 2018, lawsuits against Alex Jones and his company were launched, alleging claims from defamation to intentional infliction of emotional distress. The immediate concern was getting him to stop. That's part of the motivation for what brought these parents to finally bring suit, is particularly when they saw Parkland happen. And they saw Mr. Jones inventing the same formula. He came out that day, said Parkland is a false flag to start a civil war. Just repeating the exact same formula which brought him money from the Sandy Hook shooting, that's when the parents knew they had to speak up. But Jones did something curious, or rather, chose not to do something. I'm not the Sandy Hook man. I've already said I was sorry years and years ago. I've already tried to make restitution. They are using this case to go after the First Amendment. There has been basically a lynch mob to get Alex Jones since Trump got elected. Over the course of several different cases, Mr. Jones is being non-compliant with very basic discovery orders. And went beyond just the amount of documents he should produce or the videos. It went even into when they were asked to appear for deposition. And the judge kept giving them time and time and time again. It wasn't until the discovery abuse had gotten so egregious, where they were discovered that they had fabricated evidence, had concealed documents knowingly. That's when the judge finally entered a default judgment. And what's wild is the exact same thing happened in the Connecticut lawsuits. So to have a defendant who somehow managed through absolute refusal to participate to get themselves defaulted in two separate jurisdictions at the same time, completely unprecedented in American history. How much he has thumbed his nose in the court is truly unbelievable. This means that by law, Alex Jones automatically lost these lawsuits and therefore is liable. They're taking away your rights and your freedom to a fair trial. Judges shouldn't find people liable or guilty. Juries should do that. I think Alex Jones knew he was going to be found liable for defamation. I think he made a strategic decision. I think the stuff he didn't produce is so bad that he thought it would be better to be found liable by default, where at least he could complain that the courts were being unfair, than it would be to actually produce the evidence. But I think he didn't want anybody to see that, and that's why he did what he did. The only question that remained is how much would he have to pay up? Compensatory damages can be based on the harm suffered by the victim. Sometimes there's out-of-pocket financial harm. But the jury can also put a financial number on pain and suffering. Punitive damages are intended to punish the defendant for their bad acts. When we return, these trials end up going places no one could have imagined. Attorney Pattis, Attorney Pattis, Attorney Pattis, how many times do I have to say when I'm speaking, you stop? What do I need to do to stop the comments and the call? Just tell me what I need to do. Do I need to hold one of you in contempt? Why did Hitler blow up the Reichstag to get control? Why do government stage these things to get our guns? I mean, why can't people get that through their head? Ten years after the horror of the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting, InfoWars host and conspiracy theorist Alex Jones finds himself on trial. Multiple people who lost loved ones in the massacre and even a former FBI agent sued Jones in Connecticut and Texas for various claims such as defamation after he repeatedly and publicly called the mass shooting a hoax. No emergency helicopters were sent. The ambulances came an hour and a half later and parked down the road. DHS an hour and a half later with a timestamp put up signs saying sign in here. They had porta potties being delivered within an hour and a half. It looked like a carnival. Looked like a big PR stunt. 
We have the emails from city council back and forth and the school talking about it being shut down a year before. We have the school then being demolished and the records being sealed. We have videos uh, that look just, just incredibly suspicious where people are laughing and everything and they start huffing and puffing and start crying on TV, which is pure acting method. Alex Jones would lose these cases by default judgment for failing to comply with discovery obligations. The only question that remained for these juries was how much would they order him to pay out in damages? This man knew that parents of murdered children were emotionally distressed, outraged, grieving. And he looked straight into that camera and he said, the only problem is I've lost a lot of soap operas. I've seen actors before. It kept going. It just kept going. It doesn't stop. 2017. And it's still going. They're still making videos saying it's phony as a $3 bill. Alex Jones has already been punished. He lost all his access to the internet. Millions of dollars. He regrets what he did. To know the importance of standing up to bullies when they prey on people who are helpless and profit from them. And to know that unless you stop a bully, a bully will never stop himself. Our contention, to be clear, is that these damage claims here are exaggerated because of the idiosyncratic motives of the plaintiffs transforming their griefs into political weapons. Jones's best defense was to show that he didn't cause incremental damage to the plaintiffs. To start with, they were all family members of, of victims in these school shootings. One could argue they were already subject to as much emotional distress as you could be. What he said didn't really matter. He could argue on damages that none of them suffered substantial out-of-pocket damages, meaning they didn't have to spend specific sums of money in response to things he had said so that the dollar amounts weren't that high. To say the Alex Jones trials were different would be an understatement. Things happened that no one could have predicted, including one moment that was caught on camera after court had ended for the day. There was not great relations with opposing counsel, but with Mr. Reynaud, it was particularly abrasive. And the first time that Andino and I ever talked was outside the courthouse on the courthouse steps. And he told me at that time, in a sort of mocking way, you know, your, your clients are never going to get a dime. Ha, huh. what do you think about that? I, I knew what I was dealing with here was different than the kind of lawyer I would normally deal with. And that manifested itself at trial. Will you talk to me? And Dina, will, will you talk to me? How about you talk to me? Will you talk to me? When you said in that hallway, you, you said to me, no are all your videos I said this on is this? a summary exhibit and we're agreeing to hey all guys. Hey guys, maybe now's not the time. Maybe we can cool off and I'm going to have a phone call later. You come after a day in court which did not go very well for them. And towards the end of it particularly, we were able to lodge several objections to, to their evidence, which they had not prepared properly for trial. And, and Dino did not like that. I had this confrontation that was unlike anything I've ever had in a courtroom. I mean, it, it actually reminded me of, um, oh, I'm in eighth grade again, because all of a sudden there's this man, you know, getting up on my personal space like he's gonna have a fight with me. Uh, it, was, it was comical to me at the time. And, and I think some of my humor at that is what made him even matter, is that, that I'm not taking this like this is an actual physical confrontation. The judge had said on the record, look, if that had happened in my presence, you'd be looking at contempt right now. But the real fireworks began when Alex Jones showed up. Spit your gum out, Mr. Jones. It's not gum. Well, what is it? I, I, I had my tooth pulled uh, a week and a half ago, and it's, I, have, I had some gauze in there earlier. So you're chewing on your gauze? Would you like me to show you? No. I'm sure you're right here. I don't want to see right. the inside of your mouth. Well, I guess to put it kindly, you could say he was defiant. If you wanted to be less kind, you could say he was petulant. This is a witch hunt. This is a show trial. This will go down in history as one of the greatest show trials ever to happen, not just here, but even in places like Nazi Germany. We tell clients all the time, be quiet, don't say anything to the press. We fight our battles in the court, not out of court. But here, Alex Jones wanted to do exactly the opposite. He was there solely for his out-of-court strategy of publicity and fundraising. You encourage your audience to give you money 
is in cryptocurrency donations, right? Yes. Infowars.com forward slash crypto. That one is that was a clip on your show tonight. He is trying to keep the money flow coming in by pretending to be the real victim here. This is America. This is Texas. This is freedom. This is Christianity. This is resistance. Don't you ever not realize how important you are? And I'm talking to people that went to that puppet courthouse in Connecticut and put InfoWars stickers up everywhere. We commend you. While Jones would make outrageous statements on his show into the media, testifying under oath is a whole other story. And the world at large saw Jones doing just that when he testified in both the Texas and Connecticut trials. Have you been wanting to uh, apologize to the plaintiffs in this case for a long time? Yes. And what would you like to say to them? That I never intentionally tried to hurt you. Your belief at that time that no one died at Sandy Hook, that the whole thing was fake. Do you understand as you sit here today how crazy that is? There have been so many lies and so many things in the past and I was under a lot of pressure. And I truly, when I said those statements, when I say something, I mean it, that I really could believe that it was totally staged at that point. Do you understand now that it was absolutely irresponsible? It was, especially since I've met the parents and uh, it's 100% it's, it's, it's real. In fact, at one point, Jones actually tried to apologize to plaintiffs Scarlett Lewis and Neil Heslin. And that he's slow and I'm slow enough. That's it. You're not talking anymore. You're not doing this. That's not even a thought. That's not the way this goes. Why? Because you can't feed him fake videos anymore? Shut your I think he was genuine. I, I absolutely do. I believe that he is sorry uh, for for all the Sandy Hook stuff. I believe also, however, that he has this burning desire to satisfy an audience that has expectations of him. Yet this is just the beginning. Up next, something happens at trial that's still hard to believe. You know what perjury is, right? I just want to make sure you know before we go any further. You know what it is. Yes, I do. I mean, I'm not a tech guy. Please remember, if you need to assert it to the minute, you can. I think Sandy Hook happened, and I think it's a terrible event, and I think we need to protect our children. In 2022, 10 years after the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting, InfoWars founder and host Alex Jones is in the witness box in two different trials. The plaintiffs, primarily those who lost loved ones in the massacre, successfully sued and won judgments against Jones after he made claims that the shooting was fake and staged. The question for these juries is how much would they order Jones to pay in damages? While Jones testified that he took ownership and responsibility for the false statements. Got my head cleaned up, realized that it probably did happen and I was probably, you know, I mean, it was a good chance I was wrong. So I started basically trying to walk it back long before I got sued. At the same time, Jones and his attorneys argued he shouldn't have to pay out that much. And what didn't the plaintiff's lawyers tell you? They told you you're the conscious of the community, you know, hold Alex accountable, make a point. They never <laughs> talked about the damage you heard from no physician, you saw no medical bill, you heard nothing about a lost wage, no receipt for anything has been put before you. But when pressed by opposing lawyers, another side of Alex Jones came out. You taking this trial seriously? You're approaching it in good faith? Absolutely. Judge Maya Gamble comes from CPS, who has been exposed for human trafficking and working with pedophiles. That's what you mean when you say you're taking this seriously? I take this as serious as cancer. The person on the left of this image is our judge, correct? Yes. The person on the right is another judge you don't like, right? Yes. Okay. And hitting, let's just say this, extremely blue collar folks. I mean, ha half that jury panel does not know who I am. It's people do live in all these different bubbles. And there's the bubbles that are awake and the bubbles that are questioning, but then there's the blue city bubbles where people do not know what planet they are on. Mr. Jones, you don't like that this jury is made up of blue-collar folk. You think that's wrong? No, I don't think that. 
I'm glad that Alex Jones, when he showed up, I'm, I think he did show his true colors and he showed who he really was. He is a man that is incapable of any sort of compassion or remorse or fails to be apologetic in a sincere way. That's Robbie Parker, isn't it, Mr. Jones? Yes. That's the real Robbie Parker, isn't it? I mean, I said years ago I thought Sandy would have Robbie Parker's sitting right here. He's real, isn't he? Yes. You put a target on his back just like you did every single parent and loved one sitting here, didn't you? No, I didn't. Just like all the Iraqis, but you liberals kill and love. Just, you're unbelievable. You switch on emotions on and off when you want. You're, it's just ambulance chasing. Why don't you show a little respect? You have families in this courtroom here that lost children, sisters, wives, moms. Is this a struggle session? Are we in China? I've already said I'm sorry hundreds of times, and, I, and I'm done saying I'm sorry. But I legitimately thought it might have been staged, and I stand by that, and I don't apologize for it. And, and, and don't apologize, Mr. Jones. Please don't apologize. No, I've already apologized to the parents over because and over again. Know I don't objection. apologize to you. Objection. Don't apologize objection. to you. But there was one moment where everyone froze. Do you know where I got this? No. Mr. Jones, did you know that 12 days ago, 12 days ago, your attorneys messed up and sent me an entire digital copy of your entire cell phone with every text message you've sent for the past two years and when informed did not take any steps to identify it as privileged or protect it in any way and as of two days ago it fell free and clear into my possession and that is how I know you lied to me when you said you didn't have text messages about Sandy Hook. I still can't con convince myself of exactly what happened there. There was no in the, any indication why these documents were being sent to us. And it seemed to me that there was just a pure out mistake. That's when I contacted Mr. Raynal and said, hey, look, I think you sent this to me inadvertently. He said to just disregard the link at first. And then 10 days passed and no documents are identified as privileged. But as a result of this colossal mix up, it, it actually revealed a lot of the, the games that they had been playing. I told you the truth. This is your Perry Mason moment. I gave them my phone. And I'm going to tell you 100% he did not know. Uh, I, I don't believe he had been briefed in any way about this disclosure. And I also believe that Mr. Raynal's reaction to me after the cross-examination, where he went into a panic and wanted to know all what was disclosed, I believe that was genuine as well. You had a lawyer who was not on top of what was happening at all. That is how your client gets embarrassed on a national stage. Up next, the remarkable conclusion to the Alex Jones legal saga. And then I got on the stand and Alex was sitting in front of me and I just looked into his eyes for a long time. And I was not going to break the, the eye contact. <laughs> Because your credibility, sir, is the most important thing with your audience, isn't it? No, my most important. No? Okay, no. Your credibility is not your most important thing. It's crushing okay. the globalists. Crushing globalists. It's 2022, and InfoWars founder and host Alex Jones finds himself in two different courtrooms. In both Connecticut and Texas, the plaintiffs, primarily the families of those who lost loved ones in the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting, successfully sued Jones for his repeated comments that the massacre never happened and was staged. What do you make of the green screen with Anderson Cooper uh, down there on the ground? What do you make of the, the obvious staged interviews? And and, and multiple actors playing the part of multiple people. I mean, this is undoubted. Something's going on. The juries in both of these cases had to decide how much Jones should pay out in damages to compensate the plaintiffs for the harm they suffered and also whether to punish Jones. Not only would Jones's attorneys argue the claims were exaggerated, but Jones himself went on the defense in sometimes colorful fashion, both in court. Did you make money off of your Sandy Hook coverage? No, we lost money. It, it really hurt us. I almost didn't air the tape of the head of the state police saying there's a cover up in Uvalde. I'm sure children died is terrible, but I'm like hands off now because I don't want to be sucked into this black hole of mass shootings anymore. And out. Hey, everybody. How's it going? Everybody enjoying the show trial? For all the attention brought to Alex Jones, these cases always centered on the plaintiffs. Is what you saw in that school fake? 
No, no. <coughs> no, sir. Was it synthetic? No, sir. Those children real? It's awful. It's awful. For 27 years of my life, that woman was my best friend. And for people to tell me that she didn't exist, how you just let that happen? It makes you feel like you don't matter. You know, it makes you feel like what you went through doesn't matter. So you're not going to stop. I don't even think my pleading with you up here is going to get you to stop. And all of the damage that you've caused, there has to be accountability for that. You don't understand the repercussions to individuals' lives. You don't understand. And I don't think you will understand unless there's some form of punishment that is significant, that would make you understand that this is real. I just started talking to him. I could see the fear in his eyes. I run the Choose Love movement. Jesse, my six-year-old son, left a message on our kitchen chalkboard uh, before he died. Three words, nurturing, healing, love. And in the moment, I literally consciously practiced that formula, which is the formula for choosing love, and saw Alex for what he truly was, which is just simply a human being in pain, not getting it right, making mistakes. It turned out that Choose Love was really the theme of the lawsuit. My attorney asked the jury to choose love over hatred and fear, and they did. Question number one, $4,200,000. Question number two, $20,500,000. That Texas jury would end up awarding the plaintiffs in that case almost $50 million. But then there was Connecticut. To plaintiff Robbie Parker, A, defamation slash slander damages past and future, $60 million. B, emotional distress damages, past and future, $60 million. It was this huge weight lifted off me in the sense of like, I finally felt like I had been seen and I had been heard. That all of this stuff that I had been going through, somebody saw that and they recognized how bad it was and they recognized how atrocious it was and, and the harm that it did to me and my family. And they said, I see that and I want you to know that I see that. David Wheeler, $55 million. To plaintiff Francine Wheeler, total $54 million. To plaintiff Jacqueline Barden, $28,800,000, In total, the jury awarded the plaintiffs in Connecticut $965 million. But that's not all. Judge Barbara Bellis imposed an additional award of $473 million for punitive damages. Total $54 million. Yeah! By juror number one. Woo! $28,800,000. Initialed by juror Get those number numbers one. up. $2. Billion dollars owed by Alex Jones. I personally don't have $2 million. The company's almost completely out of money. We're in bankruptcy. There's two appeals. It'll take years. There's caps on almost all of this. This is just completely, absolutely made up. How much will he pay when this is all said and done? It, it depends on knowing the outcomes of so many contingent things about how the bankruptcy goes, how, this, how the state court appeals will go, how any negotiations go in the future. Both sets of plaintiffs have solid arguments to evade the statutory caps. We're gonna have two more trials and two more verdicts that what this shows you is that ultimately there will be a, a large group of plaintiffs, 20 of them, who are going to be dividing up the corpse of InfoWars and splitting it among themselves. The message is a very good one, and it's very important to the future of our society. The message is about the importance of truth. Truth is our reality and anything but truth is not reality. Somehow, uh, my wife and I and our family were still standing. Of course, it's complicated because there's still grief involved. There's still conspiracy theories involved. But we were able to, to get back a lot from this experience, and I'm glad that we did it because of that.
It's incredible to think about how this was a 10-year journey for these plaintiffs and Alex Jones himself. And yes, there's still more litigation and the fight over whether any money will actually be paid out looks like it won't be an easy one and may even get ugly, but nothing changes the impact and the message that was sent by these juries to Alex Jones and the country at large. And that message is that words have consequences. Thanks for joining us here on Prime Crime. Until next time, stay safe.